pleasure to be here. And um, I know there's a lot of interest in what's going on with uh, glyphosate. Um, and so what I try to do is put together some information on what the studies are that, that I think they're basing the um, rating on, and a little bit more in depth about how IR goes about uh, determining the rating. So um, maybe I'll uh, start by telling you a little bit about um, Pesticide Research Institute. We provide uh, resources and tools for risk assessment and for understanding more about how you might be exposed to pesticides, what happens if you are, and what effects pesticides may have on humans, fish, birds, bees. Um, so, um, that is the start. Um, so I want to start by uh, providing a little bit more detail about the IR process. That video was great, it was fast. So uh, I'm gonna dive in just a little bit deeper. Uh, and then we're gonna take a look at the studies on which the rating is based, at least the ones we know about. Um, and then what does this really mean for people who may be using that pesticide or thinking about using it or thinking about getting rid of it? Next slide. Okay, so um, IARC is an international body, uh, the International Agency for Research on Cancer, and they are overseen by the World Health Organization. So many governments use their expertise to understand more about the risks associated with exposures. Not just chemicals, but as, as, the, um, as Chris mentioned, you know, uh, occupational exposures, um, the, the hairdresser thing is kind of interesting. Um, and then the process is that a working group of scientists gets together and looks at all of the data. And you saw the stacks and stacks of data. What are people exposed to? How are they exposed? Um, what do we know about uh, the mechanism of carcinogenesis? Um, and then uh, animal studies, human studies, um, cell culture studies that will actually help you figure out what's going on. Are company representatives allowed to be in that working group? Representatives of companies that manufacture? I know that for the glyphosate one, for sure, <coughs> they were not. But, but JMPR, the joint, I can't remember what that stands for, but there's a there's another group that looks at pesticide residues, JMPR. And, and that group has, does have chemical company representatives. Um, and they are, they're planning on taking a second look. So, I'm not going to finish that. All right, next slide. So, um, these are the um, categories that the working group uses to weigh the evidence. Is the evidence taken on, on balance sufficient to show that there is a definite positive relationship between exposure and an outcome of cancer? And there's a lot of things that can go wrong in these kinds of studies. Not wrong, but that make it very difficult to pin something down with precision. There's multiple <coughs> exposures. People smoke, people have jobs that may expose them to other carcinogens besides the one that they're looking at. Um, there's a lot of things that might make it difficult. Many of these studies are done retrospectively, which means they ask people, what, what, did, what kinds of chemicals or what kinds of pesticides did you use in the last 10 years? Well, <laughs> no. <laughs> Are you going to remember that? Are you going to remember how many times per year? What was your exposure? So, you know, there are issues like that that make studies like that um, a little bit difficult. Um, so, and the second category down is, is there limited evidence? You know, well, maybe maybe there's some associations between cancer and the age of infection, um, but you can't really definitively say that it's true. Um, inadequate evidence, you don't have enough. Say for sure, but there's a hint of something going on. And then, you know, the, the converse is there strong evidence that the agent is not <coughs> at all? So, this is their, their calculus. So, this Oops. is in, in humans. Um, and then the same assessment is done in the animal um, So, humans and animals are different, um, or, or laboratory animals. 
Um, there are different mechanisms by which we metabolize chemicals in our bodies, between rats and humans. Um, and you know, there are different organs that take care of doing this kind of processing. Rats have a four stomach that does a lot of processing of what goes in. You know? um, and so you know, you have to take into account the physiology and the anatomy of the animal that we're talking about. Um, so sufficient evidence here um, for animals, you've got some kind of causal relationship that shows up. You dose the animals with the chemical, you get X number of tumors or, or animals with tumors, um, and then you will see if that is proportional to the dose that is given. And this needs to be true in two species of animals. So it's usually mice and rats that are tested. And or you can have two or more independent studies in different labs that get the same kind of result. That's sufficient. So limited evidence, again, you know, the experimental design might not be quite right, or the results, the interpretation of the results that you've got, you often don't have the actual raw data. So you're looking at, at uh, results that someone else has written up, and that might be confusing or not clear. Um, or if you maybe only see benign tumors and not malignant tumors. Um, they're adenomas instead of carcinomas. Um, and then, I, I'm not sure about this last one. This one seems a little sketchy to me. Tumors are observed only in a narrow range of tissues or organs. Okay, well, we've got one cancer, we've got one cancer. So, um, anyway, that, that's their criteria. Inadequate evidence, you know, it's not really <coughs> say anything definitively. <coughs> And then, of course, uh, evidence of non-carcinogenicity. So the third thing that they look at, this working group, is mechanistic data. So there are uh, tests that you can do. You may have heard of the Ames test, which looks at the mutagenicity of a chemical. It doesn't alter your DNA. And um, there are a lot of uh, cell culture like that, that will tell you something about whether the agent damages your DNA, um, messes up the chromosome, um, basically scrambles things so that you, you do get a, a cancer with effect. So um, you also can look at the tumors themselves, that's the histology, the pathology of the tumor itself. <clears throat> there may be genetic effects. Um, that are, are that go across um, from mother to child. Um, you are altering DNA when uh, when you're making a cancer cell. And um, for example, you can also look at what the molecule looks like, the agent that may be your uh, carcinogen, and say, well, is it mechanistically possible from a chemical perspective? Say, forget the biological organism. If you put these two molecules together, will they react? Alter the DNA. And um, knowing whether there are other uh, compounds that out there that will do the same kinds of things, are they similar in structure? Those, those kinds of analyses are also done. Okay, next. Do we look at mixtures in any of those? No. Uh, the question was about mixtures, and I would say that's a huge gap. Um, there are a lot of issues with. Some chemicals actually take out your body's system for detoxifying things. And if any of you are taking statins, you know that you shouldn't be drinking grapefruit juice because grapefruit juice um, you, uh, basically shuts down the production of the enzyme that metabolizes the statin. So you have to worry about mixtures, but it's, it's a very difficult thing to do technically. And so our whole system isn't yet quite geared up to So then the, like, like the little video said, they weigh all the evidence and they come up with a rating. One, carcinogenic to humans, to a probably carcinogenic, to be possibly three unclassifiable, or probably not. And then they develop the monograph. What's not done yet for glyphosate is they have not yet published the monograph. All they have published is a two-page document, or a two-page paper in Lancet. Um, 
It seems like uh, solar radiation is in two places, in the one and two. Because you had um, UV on 2A, and then you had solar radiation on one. Yeah, I know. That's what was in the, in the Solar radiation is kind of in there twice. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right, next one. Um, so that was 2A. 2B, these are the possible uh, 
uh, human carcinogens, limited evidence in humans, and not quite sufficient evidence in animals, but pretty good mechanistic evidence that there's probably a connection between the cancer that you see and the agent. Um, chlorinated phenols fall in this category, so triclosan is this hand sanitizer that's widely used. It's chlorinated. Pardon? That's, yeah, that's the, the, so the orange soaps that is, are frequently in restaurants everywhere. You can see it. Um, butylated hydroxyanisole, which is uh, used as an antioxidant in cereals and crackers and things like that. Yes? Was uh, two people in the group that glyphosate was in before it got bumped up with two way or something? No, glyphosate wasn't in a group. Not for oh, IR. They, so. they hadn't evaluated it. Uh, we'll get. We'll get to that. EPA okay. had evaluated it, and they didn't. I just pulled something down okay. as, a, as an example, okay. so I don't have to. Yeah. Uh, next one. Uh, herbicides like 2,4-D and 2,4-5-T. Uh, well, that's well. They just reevaluated 2,4-D, and it ended up in the same as a possible. Uh, carbon tetrachloride, again, used to be used as a dry cleaning solvent, but it no longer is. Chlorophthalonil is a fungicide that's widely used on fruits and vegetables and golf course turf. Um, pentachlorophenol is a wood preservative that is probably painted on many of your houses. Um, and then the other polychlorinated phenols for um, occupations, carpentry and joinery, uh, cabinet making, welding fumes, gasoline engines as opposed to diesel engines, which were 2A. Two, two um, glass wool, like insulation. Uh, BHA, preservative, and phenobarbital, which is a drug that is widely used for um, um, treatment of AFib, atrial fibrillation. Uh, next slide. Okay, so that's to give you some context for the kinds of chemicals that have these ratings. Well, I would say the committee, the working group, decided that there was sufficient evidence of cancer in mice and rats that were fed glyphosate over several years. Um, and this is where I'm not exactly sure what studies they're looking at. We're going to talk about those studies and, and see what, what we see. Um, there's strong evidence of carcinogenicity from mechanistic studies, they note. Um, that explain how glyphosate may cause cancer, and then there's limited evidence of cancer in humans from epidemiological studies um, of people. And most of these studies have been done with pesticide applicators or farmers. Next slide. So we're going to start by looking at the um, human epi studies. Um, in 1999, uh, several two Swedish scientists published um, a paper that showed a correlation that was not statistically significant, but yet significant enough to publish <laughs> um, of exposure to glyphosate with uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And to put this in context, people who work with pesticides a lot, like farmers and, and pesticide applicators, <coughs> tend to have a higher incidence of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, and so what you've got going on there is a huge mixture of exposures. You're, the farmers are using the herbicide one week and an insecticide the next week and a fungicide with <laughs> an herbicide the, the, the next time. So a lot of mixtures, a lot of potential for what we call confounding, where you can't tell what the effect is from. Is it from one chemical, the other, or the mixture? Yeah. Say it again. Okay. Yes, okay. exactly. Okay. All right, so a little bit about this. So the, the odds ratio tells you you know, how much more likely you are to um, have gotten cancer if you were exposed versus <coughs> not exposed. And this was a retrospective study, so this required people to remember well what um, they were exposed to. So the point that was just made is that if your confidence interval is below one, it's not statistically significant. So that's, that's why it's, you know, not significant. But it's a trend, and you can see that you know it's the odds ratio, the range goes up to the confidence interval goes up to 13, which is pretty high. Um, the the problem with this is that there was a very small number of cases in control, four cases in control, not enough to really say that. <laughs> but it's enough to 
raise a flag. Next slide. In 2002, these guys went back and they, they, hairy cell leukemia is another type of non hodgkin It's They're related. So they pooled that data and said, okay, well, let's look at those types of cancers together. And uh, they found that they actually got more cases that way. They were able to move forward. That's And they found statistical significance. One, a confidence interval that got from good one, 1.08 to 8.52. Uh, and risk increased with increased exposure. So that's kind of an important observation. It's still confounded by multiple exposures, but you're starting to see what's going on. Excellent. Uh, 2008, they included additional data after 1998, also still pooling the data, still retrospective, and they found, again, a statistically significant association, um, odds ratio 2.02, confidence interval definitely includes one, so we the statistical significance is good. And then if you had more than 10 days of exposure to glyphosate in a year, uh, maybe that's, I think, in throughout the, the period that they were looking at, um, the odds ratio goes up. So, um, and then uh, the high end of the confidence ratio, or the confidence interval also goes up. So they had 910 cases and 1,000 so this is a good sized study, and they're starting to put some significance into the idea that non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and glyphosate are potentially associated. You still have the potential confounding with the long-term exposure. <coughs> Excellent. McDuffie, this is a Canadian study. Um, they also found a correlation between non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and glyphosate exposure. Um, for people exposed at least 10 days per year. Uh, their odds ratio was about the same as the other one, so it's starting to be consistent. Um, and then if they put all of the subjects in, including the ones that only used it once a year or twice a year or whatever, <coughs> you lose the significance. So that that is actually a starting to be a reproducible um, observation. They had 23 cases and 36 controls, so it's an okay size.
see them often enough so that they don't have that, that recall problem mm -hmm. where they can't remember what they did 10 years ago. Um, so this is a much better study design. And they found no correlation between glyphosate exposure and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma in the first paper. Um, but they did find a statistically significant association with multiple myeloma, another form of cancer. Um, non, not statistically significant. Confidence interval is, is score one. Um, but for the highest exposure group, it did creep into the significant numbers. Huge number of people in this study, so there's no problem with having good statistics. Um, and then the authors also say, well, you know, there are still limitations in the data for, for um, making, you know, for pinning down something as a definitive cause of cancer. Mm -hmm. Yes. Is part of the study that came down to the team that they used other pesticides? Yes. Yes. So yes. I remember yes. reading that they were very impressed with it. I thought that should be yes. a major limitation. And the surprising thing is that 13,000 did not use pesticides at all. Yeah, right. <laughs> That probably wouldn't be true today. So, and Mary brings up a good point there. Um, the limitations are that there are multiple exposures. These are, these are farmers. They're using lots of different pesticides. So you've gotten rid of the recall bias or the recall problem, but you still have the issue that they are using lots of different chemicals. And sometimes together. Spouses handle the clothes. You know, say 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 it's a classic traditional marriage <laughs> where the woman does the laundry. Um, not in my house. Um, um, so you know they're exposed to the, you know the, the person who comes in from the field. They're you know hugging them or touching them, and you know people don't wash up right away. So. start the Ag Health study, I don't know the exact dates. Um, so they're still collecting data. So they're going to redo this analysis. Um, I think they started in 73, was it? No, no, no. Not very, not that long ago. 2000 or something? I don't know. No answer that. But it's, they've been going for about 15 years now. Is my guess. Um, all right. That was human studies. Now, there may be other studies that the committee, the working group, looked at. They didn't talk about, I mean, these are the studies that I found in the literature. And that's why I can't wait until that uh, monograph comes out so that we can actually see what they're talking about. So <coughs> now we're going to look at the animal studies. These also are the only animal studies that I had access to. They may have had access to others. So whatever. Um, rats. Uh, study lasts for 24 months, two years, the lifetime of the rat. So whenever you do a cancer assessment, you basically give your test animals a series of different doses over a lifetime for the animal. And normally for cancer studies, you actually do kind of bump it up to pretty high doses, the maximum tolerated dose uh, that will still provide, uh, that will still allow your animal And HDT is highest dose tested. Um, for the top one, 31.5 milligrams per kilogram per day was the highest dose tested. That's kind of mid-range for a lot of toxicity tests. Something like the second study where the highest dose tested was over 1,000 milligrams per kilogram per day, that's a lot. <laughs> that's really high. And um, so we have to take those with a little bit of a grain of salt. Um, rats, 26 months, uh, they didn't report the highest dose tested. So we saw <coughs> some tumors in all of these, even at the low, the kind of mid-range one, 13.5. Testicular tumors in high-dose males, increased pancreatic islet cell adenomas, benign, um, and adrenal cortical carcinomas at the highest dose tested. The, the last study, thyroid tumors, this is Toxicologists were evaluating the study, um, dismissed these as just normal incidents, 
you do have background levels of um, cancer. I wonder these days, with all of the Roundup Ready corn and soybeans, what are they feeding the rats? <laughs> 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 yeah. So they're probably you know, the controller is probably being exposed to. There's some, see, there's some of the GMO results look very similar to that. Yeah. The, the food is GMO food. Yeah. That is not being well uh, controlled for. It is what the studies are looking at. And I think people are just starting to think about um, and the problem in, the, in this last study is that they didn't dose the rats high enough to really get a good study. Next slide. Mice. Okay, remember, for if you want sufficient evidence in animals, you need two species. So um, mice, two years, lifetime of, of a mouse, um, didn't get the highest dose tested. But basically, they saw lots of different tumors, lung tumors, liver tumors, Tumors of the lymphoventricular system. I'll ask Dr. Moses why that is. Um, so there's no clear uh, dose response relationships, which is something that um, you look for. If you dose the animals higher, you should see more tumors if it is indeed the agent that's causing the, the tumors. Um, and it wasn't statistically significant compared to controls. But again, what's going on with controls? You don't know that. So all of all of these were animal studies, by the way, were done by the manufacturers of the pesticides in uh, preparation for getting the chemical register for use as a recycle um, by EPA. Um, there are guidelines for um, doing those tests. So EPA lays out how the tests should be done. The, the tests are done hopefully in accordance with the guidelines, but there are still ways to manipulate that data. It's Again, what's HD? Highest dose tested. All right, second one, um, pancreatic, pancreatic islet cell adenomas, adrenal cortical porcelain, and renal tubule, tubule adenomas um, was higher than the uh, controls. Two of the toxicologists said, well, they're not treatment related, they're something else is <laughs> causing this. Um, anyway, um, next slide. Okay, so those were the animal studies, and again, I'm, there's probably more that the committee reviewed, but I don't have access to them. We'll find them out when we get them on the record. So mechanistic studies are usually done in cell culture. These are things like the Ames test, um, and it's mostly negative for mutation of DNA. It doesn't seem to alter the DNA structure. Um, chromosomal aberration, mostly negative and DNA damage mostly negative. So EPA's final assessment and Cal EPA's final assessment is that it's not genotoxic or mutagenic, um, nor clastogenic, which is causing or inducing breaking of the chromosomes. Um, but recent studies are showing um, some evidence that like to say in formulation, which means the product with all of its quote inert ingredients, um, and the inert ingredients may not be innocent here. Um, there is some evidence that there are some clastogenic activity that the chromosomes are being disrupted. So there again, there may be more studies there that we're going to find out. Next slide. Yes. Is it assumed that the inerts are no. Is that the assumption? Well, from the 70s to now, they changed the definition of inert. No, inert it means just as dirty as anything else. Are the studies reflecting what he said? <laughs> Are the studies reflecting that? They're doing the studies on the pure active ingredient. And that's it. Not the soup. They do the, they do the acute toxicity tests on the soup. There's a, what's called a six pack. You know, does it, uh, an LB50. What is it? Does it kill you? With a lower dose with the formulated product or not. Is there any movement to try to get them to require them to list the notes? Or is that? Yes, someone right just filed a lawsuit last week. Yay. Maybe earlier this week. Uh, Center for Environmental Health. Let's let me know. Um, okay, so here's what the working group said about glyphosate. There's sufficient evidence of cancer in mice and rats that were fed glyphosate over several years. We saw those results. They were you know, there's definitely some tumors in there. Um, there's strong evidence of carcinogenicity from mechanistic or cellular studies. I didn't see that in those mm -hmm. studies that, that I looked at. They must have been looking at something else. Um, and then there's 
And they said, IARC, however, did not base its decision on all this, all this evidence. Instead, IARC discarded, disregarded dozens of scientific studies and relied heavily on papers that created false associations. Okay. Um, so Crop Life America, is, which is the um, chemical manufacturer's lobby, uh, published an article and they said, well, EPA reviewed over 55 EPI studies conducted on the possible cancer and non-cancer effects of glyphosate. Our review, this is the EPA staff are talking, our review concluded that this body of research does not provide evidence to show that glyphosate causes cancer, does not warrant any change in EPA's cancer classification for glyphosate. So looking back at the history of the cancer rating at EPA for glyphosate, IRIS, the Integrated Risk Information System um, page on glyphosate, it was rated initially as a Group C, that's EPA's categorization, it's kind of like a 2D for uh, IR. Possible carcinogen, that was in 93. Um, the current IRIS category is a D, Class D, not classifiable as to human carcinogenicity. But OPP, the Office of Pesticide Programs, a different branch of EPA, says it's Group E, there's evidence of non-carcinogenicity for humans. So the new in the other system? No. Okay. Well, well, the, new I mean, <laughs> the older ones, maybe. I mean, I wasn't paying attention back then, but right now, they haven't updated anything in so many years, yeah. and it's all tied up with politics. What was the question? Do, do I trust IRIS? And, and they're so far behind, they're so outdated in their assessments that they're not useful. Okay, um, so EPA is in, uh, has glyphosate in what they call registration review. Every 15 years, EPA reevaluates every pesticide, and they promised a um, careful look <coughs> at what IR put together. So we'll hope to see that in the next six months or so. The uh, German Federal Institute for Risk Assessment basically said it's not possible to fully comprehend indications for a genotoxic potential of glyphosate based on the short report published by IR. <laughs> I actually agree. <laughs> it's, so, it's so short, you don't know what's going on. Uh, in, in particular, also due to the fact that the assessment included studies using different glyphosate-containing plant protection products that are not specified in any detail. So this gets back to the issue of the inerts, <laughs> the formulated product. Um, the BFR, the, that they use, will perform a thorough review of the classification. So a lot of other groups are going to go back and look at that. Um, the Netherlands Board of Authorization of Plant Protection Products, there's no reason to suspect that glyphosate causes cancer and changes to the classification of glyphosate. That's the quote. Based on the large number of genotoxicity and carcinogenicity studies, the EU, US EPA, and the WHO panel of the joint FAO uh, meeting on pesticide residues, that's the JMPR, concluded that glyphosate is not carcinogenic. The JMPR committee is the one that does have pesticide company representatives or people associated with them on it. And, and there's a very bad history of joint FAO approval on that. And uh, you know, I just, there's because the industry NRDC is working to um, make sure that WHO excludes people with conflicts of interest from that committee. I don't know whether they'll succeed, but they've got they a really good petition. <coughs> and anyway, they, finally they say, um, it's not clear on what basis and in what manner I have established the question just the glyphosate. And again, that's kind of making the case that we still need more work. We need to see what they do. Excellent. Health Canada. Health Canada basically reviewed glyphosate for re-registration in 2015. Their conclusion was, well, hazard identification, including carcinogenic, carcinogenic potential, is an important component in the determination of potential human health risk. The determination of such risk, however, is not solely driven by the hazard profile, as Chris was saying, but also exposure. Um, it's a function of potential exposure. For this reason, both the hazard and the exposure Potential must be considered together when performing the human health risk assessment for pesticide, since an identified hazard may be offset by the lack of exposure. Um, and what they basically noted was there's a low level of concern for glyphosate due to the benign nature of the tumors observed and at the limit dose, the highest dose tested, and the 
lack of oncogenicity in other studies. So that's Health Canada, that's the equivalent of EPA in Canada. That, that basically, they, they, kind of, they kind of agree that there's uh, some tumor risk, but it occurs at high doses. And that you may or may not, that you're Excuse likely. Me, I have a question in regards to high doses for what we use, okay? What, I'm using one to three ounces per gallon. So I use it twice a year. I'm not pouring the concentrate on my hands. I'm not in cute, I'm not inhaling the fumes. So what is my potential risk? I'm 62 years old. I've got maybe 10 years of life left. What the hell do I care? I just want to spray my Roundup and simplify my life. And they cut the Roundup out of the PUC. I can't do a damn thing. My life is crumbling with weeds and I'm tired of it. I want you to make it easier for me to spray now. I've been cut out. I don't know about these other guys, but my, I'm a life of, I'm supposed to have seven gardeners, I've only got three. I'm overwhelmed with the amount of work I got to okay. do. That's a harder, that's a harder problem than I'm going to talk about right now. <laughs> Good one, Jack. Step up, step down. <laughs> next slide. Oh, wait. Yeah, next slide. Okay, so it's pretty clear that we really need to see what those guys do to know, to know what's going on. What human studies did they evaluate? I think we, I think we cut most of the ones that were in the literature. What animal studies were evaluated? There seems to be a few missing from that. What mechanistic information was considered? I'm quite sure I don't have all of that. Do you have any disclosure rules about the public right to see the data or anything like that? Would it all of their The committee will get to see some of the raw data that is never accessible to the public. Yes. How are the lines of that Food, food, in the food. Actually, Susan, I read I read the opposite on the IRC. They, they claimed that they were only using public data, publicly available data. They uh, said it was publicly available. That's what they said in one of the, one of the pages that they were only. So I I want to figure that out. I'll be surprised to see that. Okay. But for this one. For this one. For this one, they yeah. yeah. But I know that they have the past had access to confidential business information. I, I don't know. I don't know the history. Yeah. I read that too. Yeah. Actually, I read that too. All right, well, okay, so now, there's one thing that we haven't really talked about in detail, and that is how potent a carcinogen is this chemical. Um, that matters because if something is super potent, you only need to be exposed to a little tiny bit, and you may get cancer. But if it's, you know, yeah, if you get exposed to a thousand milligrams per kilogram, you're gonna be, you know, for a whole lifetime, you're gonna get cancer, maybe it's not something you really want to worry about sometimes because you're not going to be getting that kind of exposure. So cancer potency is our term for saying how much the cancer rate in a population, how many people per million uh, po population, how does that increase with an increase in exposure? <coughs> and, you know, for this, this is an example, you've got a dose, parts per million in your food if you're a rat. Um, and you can see, you know, there's a Usually you assume a linear dose of generic. This is generic. Generic, generic yeah. Um, next slide. So cancer potency and cancer ratings don't match necessarily. So some things that are known carcinogens may be less potent than things that are um, probable or possible carcinogens. So let's look at a, a few of these. So the potency is what we call Q star. And the lower the number, the less potent it is in causing cancer. So methylene chloride is a solvent, that's the lowest one on this list. Actually, there's many below that, but I'll just pick that one. Um, and it's got a possible rating from IR. Um, we also have one 3 dichloropropene that's also possible, and it's got a 0.04 value of order of magnitude factor 10 higher. Then there's a toxicine, which is a 2B possible, same deal, with a 1.1 potency. So you get exposed to toxicine, and even though they're calling it a possible carcinogen, it's actually quite potent at causing cancer. So what this kind of points out is that the system that they use for rating these things is based on what people, what we know about what people are exposed to. The known carcinogens are the things that have been used in industry, solvents, um, things that we've been using for a long time, like heavy metals, and we know about exposure and, and incidence of disease. Um, things like drugs, where you're taking a particular dose and you know how much you're taking and you can track the result. So the fact that it's known doesn't necessarily mean it's potent. Con 
conversely, if it's possible or probable, it can still be quite potent. And it just may not have been, you know, we don't have enough data to say no because of the way it's consistent. Are there not some chemicals that have higher, or highly efficient cell transport into the cell and the others? There's all kinds of reasons why they might be more potent. That's, that's one of them, for sure. So it's, it's about how sure we are about the evidence versus what the evidence would say if it's true in terms of you know, its potency. potency. Yeah. I put one in here, core picker. That one's not even evaluated by IR. And it was uh, EPA basically in one sentence in the risk assessment saying, well, you know, we didn't look at the cancer data. Which which you talking about? Core picker. Core picker. Second one. Which is widely Why used. Is <laughs> widely used. It's a fuming and it's gases and it's drifting in there. Pure gas. It lives down in the, in the mm -hmm. strawberry country. And DPR, Department of Pesticide Regulation, did do a careful evaluation of it and they gave it a cancer potency factor of 2.2, which is high, very high. And, and IR has been evaluated. So you can see that sometimes these listings are whatever they get around to or whatever they are not to look at, you know, you see a lot of that. Um, <coughs> so there are issues here. So this tells me that um, focusing on uh, the dyeing industry and other dye industry in other countries might be a really important thing for public health and benzene. Benzene, yeah. Uh, one of the things that they never, never stress, I realize it's difficult, is very young. <laughs> so we don't know what the cancer potency of glyphosate is. However, I mean, you have to do some special studies to figure that number out. Um, but the fact that you're getting tumors only in the individuals exposed to the highest dose suggests that the potency is low. You can be exposed to a lot before you get cancer. Um, suggests this. I'm not. It's not. Is that? It's just. This is what we're. The implications are that people who are exposed to a lot of glyphosate are, they have reason to be concerned much more than people who might apply it twice a year. Um, and as uh, Dr. Lee said, children are typically more susceptible to this. And both EPA and more carefully, OEHA, have put together guidelines for assessing risks to children and also for less than lifetime exposure. Because the way things change these days with chemicals, you're not necessarily exposed to a chemical for a whole lifetime. It's, it's changed unless it's like gasoline or whatever. Um, so for children, potency is assumed to be a factor of 10 higher. That's the default that we have. Okay, <laughs> one more thing. Um, so in uh, pursuit of larger markets, uh, glyphosate products are now being marketed to farmers as what are called burn down herbicides. So as you get close to harvest, they apply herbicide to the, to the field and this kills all the greenery around the wheat or barley or rye or whatever. And um, it allows the farmers to harvest the wheat about a week to 10 days before they otherwise could. So it gives them some flexibility. Um, Um, what this means, glyphosate, once it gets into plants, doesn't go away, as we learned from the study that we're in the municipal water district did. Um, it's not metabolized by the plant, it's not excreted by the plant, there's no microbes inside the plant to chew it up. Um, so it doesn't go away. So it's probably there in all of our food. USDA doesn't analyze for glyphosate in its pesticide data program or its metabolite. So we don't, we don't exactly know. <coughs> Next slide. Yeah, are you talking about treating the grains here, or they spray the, the field? field. They the spray whole, the field. That's of for Roundup Ready. No, no. no. They basically want to kill the wheat, 
so that they can harvest the grain sooner, a week sooner. Is it cooler? Yeah, and it doesn't clog up their equipment. Mm -hmm. Susan, it also causes the grain to ripen more quickly mm -hmm. so that you get more, more even production. And the other thing is that the, uh, it's cheaper if you get rid of all the debris to harvest. Yeah, it's definitely it's an advantage for the farmers. It's cheaper to harvest it if you get rid of all the greenery and you know For me, because we have the precautionary principle here in the city, and that's a, for me personally, that's a classic example of is asking necessary? the question, is it necessary? Is it really necessary to have that extra week, at, you know, at the risk of a lot of unknowns for people who are eating the wheat? Doesn't it, doesn't it follow that, you know, the Stokes for glyphosate is actually quite high. Um, it's uh, two milligrams per kilogram per day. That means it's very low acute toxicity. Low acute toxicity. So you can probably evaluated that risk and said we're below any okay. level of concern. Next slide. Okay, what do we do instead? <coughs> um, we have a whole shelf full of alternate herbicides. Next slide. You gonna tell us what some of those are? Yes. So uh, this is an evaluation of herbicides that are used in weed management. Um, and this is relative risk. So let's take a minute to think about what this plot means. So we've got the different herbicides on the, um, the vertical axis. Aminopyrolid, clopyrolid, or sulfuron, glyphosate. 
these are the Forest Service spreadsheets, and it assumes a certain amount of absorption of the skin over a certain period of time. Yes. So the ones in the red are you're above the reference dose. The ones in the yellow are kind of you know it's close to it, but not quite in it. And the ones in the green are um, far below the reference dose. Susan, can we just say uh, the top one is milestone? Amino pyrrolid. Amino pyrrolid is the first one on top, and that's milestone. Oh, okay. so and then chlorpyrrolid is lantrel or transline. I don't know what chlorosulfur is. Okay, we don't use that. <coughs> Glyphosate roundup. Imazapir is habitat, right? Yeah. Uh, triclopyr is um, uh, garlon and turflon. Well, and actually, there's two triclopyrs, and I. I What's the difference between the Triethylamine salt um, is, uh, doesn't go through your skin as rapidly, so it's less toxic to applicators, but if you just get it in your eyes, it causes irreversible <coughs> eye damage. So is that, that one is garlon 3A? Garlon 3A is the triethylamine okay. salt, and tri garlon 4A is the triethylamine salt. Okay. Garlon 3A is the triethylamine salt, and garlon 4A is the triethylamine salt. Good question. It's, um, the Forest Service put these things together, and basically it was whatever was in use at the time. So some of these are based on older studies, but they're assuming you know protective gear that's required by the label and typically used by pesticide applicators, not leather gloves. Can I can I add, Susan? Can I just add that the exposures they used on this, when we did the calculations uh, for what we use on our lands, it was way 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 higher than what we typically use for the for the triclop here. So it's just, you should keep that in mind. That this, is way, way this is way, way higher. Yeah. Because they, you know, they spray. Because they, they put the blow on as well as the chemicals, correct? No, no, well, no. No, they're just making an assumption based on surface area exposed and then the rate at which it goes through your skin. And there's, there's some assumptions. But they're pretty good and they match with experimental data. So it's been validated. The model's been validated pretty well. Susan, I didn't hear your answer to the good question about the glove. What type of um, plastic, rubber, rubber gloves. Actually not rubber. going through the glove and into your skin. No, it's, it's like you, you get some on your hands and, and you just stick your hand in the glove. Like this or yeah. whatever. It's still <laughs> Apparently, I mean, from my applicator friends, they say it does happen. <laughs> um, all right, so amino pyrrolid was lower. Mm -hmm. Pyrrolid for sulfuron, like I say, was pretty low based on, you know, this was before we. Um, these particular assessments don't take into account carcinogenicity. Um, only um, non cancer effects. Mazapir. So there are issues, though. If you're looking for a different herbicide, aminopyrrolid um, and mazapir are not so good for, um, they're good for broadly, but not so good for um, grasses and things like that. So glyphosate has these. Glyphosate had the advantage that it's broad spectrum and it works on both grasses and um, broadly weeds. It kills everything essentially. So some of these other ones are not none, are none selective. Of are two, are none of these none are percentages. Right? No, no, no. Next slide. So this is for general exposure. So this is based on studies done of applicators working in the field where they monitor do biomonitoring glyphosate residues in their urine after working with the herbicide for a day or five days and they can find out that just working with the herbicide you're going to be exposed to some extent. There are, you know, there's variability in which applicator gets the most exposure. Some people may not wear gloves. Other people are very, very careful, you know, that there is variability, but, you know, you will have some exposure when you use it. And again, you know, here are the ones that are And then general public, okay, so you're walking through a recently sprayed area and, you know, the, maybe you're a woman wearing shirts, shorts and a t-shirt with that much skin exposed and the assumption is that, you know, you've got some certain amount of surface area, you touch the vegetation as you go through, some of it is absorbed into the body and you can calculate what the exposure is. And again, you know, these same ones start come to the top, amino pyrrolid or sulfuron, sulfometro and methyl, and still looking at those, net sulfuron, methyl, or pyrrolid, and acetyr, that can was in there too, next one. However, <laughs> a lot of these lower toxicity chemicals are very persistent, very persistent. And in fact, copyrolid and amino pyrrolid are 
once that um, lasts in compost so long that if you mow your, mow your grass and uh, put the clippings in the compost pile and then use the compost to fertilize your garden the next year, you'll kill your garden with the compost. Oh. So some of these have issues. <laughs> Roads into landscaping 